My name is Claire Davidson. I am on the healthcare team at Mindset Health. Um, we are really excited to have Dr. Peters and Dr. Real here um, to, to speak about um, the role of psychological therapies in managing IBS patients. Um, I will hand it over to you both to just do a brief introduction of yourselves. So maybe Megan, you can start. Sure. So thank you for having me tonight. I'm Megan Real. I'm a GI psychologist um, clinically practicing at the University of Michigan. I am also the director of behavioral health for GI On Demand, which is a joint venture of Gastro Girl Inc. and the American College of Gastroenterology. And um, I've been uh, fortunate to do some, some work and uh, collaboration with Dr. Peters. So it's fun to um, be coming to you internationally tonight or this morning for for those that are <laughs> not in. Say, for us in Australia here it's morning uh, so uh good morning to those who are who are on my side of the world um I'm Dr Simone Peters I am the founder and the managing director of the Mind and Gut Clinic which is a multidisciplinary clinic here in Melbourne in Australia where we treat uh, patients who present with various gastrointestinal complaints. Um, I also have a research position with Monash University um, and the role there is to explore the efficacy of different therapies um, when it comes to managing largely functional gastrointestinal disorders, so things like irritable bowel syndrome. Um, and I'm also the head of clinical content for NERVA. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm involved in the development of all of the content that you see through the app, so the psychoeducation and the gut-directed hypnotherapy recordings. And as Megan mentioned, um, I'm very fortunate to have been able to work with Megan uh, over the years, um, and it's really nice to be able to present to you all today. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, we will just jump right in. Obviously, this uh, webinar is about the role of psychological therapies in IBS. Um, so I think, Megan, we'll start with you. Could you please just um, give us a little explanation of um, the gut-brain axis and um, why psychological therapies are appropriate for patients uh, with IBS? Well, the, we, many of us have heard of the brain-gut connection, the brain-gut access, and it really is a communication pathway. It's kind of the super highway that every single one of us experiences. And it's the brain communicating down to the gut and the gut communicating up to the brain. So there is this bi-directional pathway that's driven by nerves, um, our enteric nervous system. It can be impacted by things like stress, nutrition, um, things that happened in childhood. So there's a lot of different factors it really can complicate an IBS diagnosis um, that, that we like to be able to address as GI psychologists. So um, we can really get at the heart of that, at times, miscommunication that's happening in, in folks that have IBS and really help the person to learn strategies to help um, facilitate a more healthy conversation that happens between the brain and the gut. Awesome. Um, and Dr. Peters, could you just um, explain if uh, psychological therapies are best used um, alone or in tandem with, with other treatment modalities? So I think if you're talking about irritable bowel syndrome as an example, there's three um, main methods of management, if you like. There's the pharmaceutical route, there's the uh, dietary route, and there's the psychological route. Um, and look, to be fair, most patients who present with GI disorders respond best to a multidisciplinary approach. Most patients will respond well to a combination of the three different routes. Um, and obviously, if we're focusing on the role of psychological therapies today, which psychological therapy is the most appropriate um, is also largely dependent on the patient that's sitting in front of you. Um, and obviously, we'll get into, into that in more detail um, as the webinar goes on. Yeah, we, we might as well get into that now. Um, can you give us a little explanation of uh, what uh, psychological therapies are out there and available um, and sort of the level of research backing they have behind them. And then uh, we'll, we'll get into which patients are, are appropriate for which, which therapies, but we'll start with um, what's available out there. 
So obviously there's lots of different psychological therapies that are available. Um, and again, it's largely dependent on the patients that's sitting in front of you. I guess in the context of the webinar today, the therapies that have the most evidence of efficacy in patients who present with irritable bowel syndrome, as an example, uh, cognitive behavioural therapy, mindfulness-based therapy and hypnotherapy. Um, now, obviously, it, you know, if the patient who's sitting in front of you isn't it's not neither of those therapies are the most appropriate for that person then obviously it's within the psycho psychologist's realm to move beyond those therapies um but if we look a little bit about uh, consider hypnotherapy as an example we know that in patients who have irritable bowel syndrome the vast majority of people respond to this as a therapy so we see about 80 percent of patients respond to this and of those patients who respond we see about a 70 75 percent improvement in their symptoms Similarly, with cognitive behavioural therapy, really notable outcomes um, and similar percentages in terms of those rates of efficacy to that of hypnotherapy. So the question really comes down to which is the most appropriate therapy. Um, and typically speaking, we would use um, hypnotherapy to target the physical symptoms, so the physical complaints. So these include things like issues with somebody's um, uh, bowel symptoms, so whether they have diarrhea or constipation or they alternate between the two, whether they experience abdominal pain, which are obviously the two um, key uh, components of somebody meeting the diagnostic criteria for having irritable bowel syndrome, but then often it goes beyond that and we see things like bloating, distension, um, wind, occasionally even upper GI symptoms. Um, so if we are using the psychological therapy to target that physical response, Hypnotherapy is usually the therapy that we would use. If, however, that patient who's sitting in front of us needs more support from a psychological perspective, or if they have more notable psychological comorbidities, it's probably likely that they are going to respond best to something like cognitive behavioural therapy or some other psychological-based intervention that isn't targeting the physical response. Would you agree with that, Megan? Yeah, and I think highlighting that these are what we now have termed under the umbrella of brain-gut behavioral therapies. So these are our therapies that you've probably heard of, maybe cognitive behavioral therapy more so than gut-directed hypnotherapy, but we really have taken these um, already well-researched types of uh, psychological intervention and honed them in specifically to different characteristics and factors that are specific to a GI condition and helping a patient to manage their GI condition. But as Dr. Peters highlighted, we actually are helping with symptoms and the and a lot of that speaks to the benefits of using these therapies to just target that brain gut connection. Um, so in addition to, to those therapies, uh, learning self-management strategies and learning psychoeducation from the perspective of how do I learn more about what's happening? What is the brain gut axis? Um, what does it look like to have improvement? Does it mean that I'm never going to have a flare of my IBS again? And I think the the answer is always it's there's no cure, there's no magic pill, um, but we will be able to help you have probably less frequent symptoms, shorter duration, less severe symptoms, and overall improve your confidence to manage. And when all of that comes together, we really see people having a much improved quality of life. Uh I have a question for you, Megan, about um, when I, Dr. Peters just uh, beautifully described um, the, the different psychological therapies and which patients are a good fit. Um, but I imagine when you're seeing patients uh, and and coming up with a, with a plan for patients, it's often a combination of psychological therapies. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering how you sort of decide, and I'm sure it's a case by case, um, case by case, but also um, what tells there are in deciding which patients are appropriate for one psychological therapy or a combination of, of all of them? Mm -hmm. The Yes, so it's important to kind of, and that's, I think, the benefit of working in person with someone um, is that we are able to take from different schools of, of psychological intervention and 
um, I think that most of the time we're using some aspect of cognitive behavioral therapy, helping the patient learn more about their diagnosis, um, teaching basic relaxation strategies such as diaphragmatic breathing, muscle relaxation. And then again, for those patients that really are intensely feeling the physical symptoms, and we're hoping to help um, decrease those visceral sensations or GI specific anxiety. Um, hypnosis is a, a wonderful uh, tool, but sometimes, you know, we may be able to recognize the patient needs to do some really entry level relaxation work. Maybe this is someone that's still not very comfortable in their body or even angry with their body because of how it's behaving. So we can slow that process down, not necessarily jumping into the hypnosis protocol, you know, day one. Um, though I will say many patients are ready to do that. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I typically have a, a very strong marriage of using hypnosis. And that usually takes maybe half of the 60 minute session that I have with patients. And then maybe I'm noticing there's some certain anxieties that they have around their symptoms. Um, you know, fear of getting on public transportation, not wanting to um, let anybody else drive because they want to feel the control of if I need to leave to go to the bathroom. Um, so some of these very common anxieties around GI conditions, it's perfectly addressed with cognitive behavioral therapy, helping patients understand that how they think impacts how they behave, which impacts how they feel and all of that interconnection. So we really personalize and tailor um, when we have the opportunity to. You touched on something there that um, I'll, I'll turn over to Dr. Peters, but I would actually love both of your opinions on this, um, on how you address uh, bringing in psychological therapies to patients that are um, possibly hesitant to, to incorporate psychological therapies, specifically patients that um, don't see any stress or anxiety trigger, triggers with their symptoms and um, don't feel that psychological therapies are, are appropriate for them. So um, I think that there's often a high level of skepticism in terms of the role of, of psychological based therapies um, in this patient population. And I guess at the entry point level, it does come down to a lot of discussions that I had prior to the patient even arriving to Megan and I. So this is when the patient is meeting with their primary physician or they've been referred through to their gastroenterologist. And I guess this is where it's really important that these conversations around the importance or certainly the role of psychological therapy in terms of managing these symptoms should be initially broached. Um, and often these are the people that are then referring the patients through to psychological services like what Megan and I provide. So the patients who are probably dead set against the role of, of, of psychological therapies probably don't arrive to Megan and I. Um, but when they, by the time that they do, I mean, obviously they're open to exploring it at least somewhat, given that they've given up their time and, and they're paying for a service. Um, so um, I think when, when these patients arrive, um, it's about validating the patient initially that, um, that there is merit in them receiving this kind of, of care um, and listening to the patient in terms of what it is that their concerns are around engaging with psychological therapy. But then I think it becomes about educating that person um, because you're very right. There might very well be a percentage of patients who present who don't have any psychological comorbidities whatsoever, but those patients will very likely respond to psychological care, even though they don't have psychological comorbidities. And we would, ex I would explain this to the patient. And if we use hypnotherapy as an example, I would often explain to the patient, like I mentioned to you before, that we're actually targeting the physical symptoms, not the psychological symptoms. And I would probably spend quite a bit of time talking about the research that we've done in this space. And certainly the research that I've conducted with Monash University, where we actually don't include participants who have psychological comorbidities into our trials. Um, because obviously in these studies, we want textbook irritable bowels. We want no confounders whatsoever. Um, and so in these studies, we actually don't include people who meet the diagnostic criteria for having a psychological disorder. Um, and 
these are the people that respond and see improvements in their symptoms by 70, 75%. So even though we're applying a psychological therapy, it doesn't mean that we are trying to manipulate how you feel psychologically. In saying that, the flip side of the coin is that there are those patients who have psychological comorbidities and either aren't aware of it um, or are aware of it but are still resistant to engaging in this kind of therapy. Um, and, again, it's about open lines of communication with these patients about what they feel comfortable with, what they don't feel comfortable with, and what you typically find over time is that they warm up to the idea of receiving psychological care. And, again, in this example, I might start with hypnotherapy because it seems, um, you know, the less psychologically based therapy, um, build rapport with this patient, and then more often than not this patient will then say, oh, actually, you know, I think you might be right or I think my doctor might have been right or I think I've identified that actually, you know, my anxiety contributes to my symptoms more than what I ever gave it credit for or, or what have you. The other possibility is that there is this group of people who just aren't aware of the fact that they are in a high stress state or they are, do meet the diagnostic criteria for having an anxiety disorder or a depressive disorder. And these patients you just tread very carefully with to begin with, again, until you've built enough rapport that you can have these sometimes challenging discussions with them um, and then where necessary refer them to the appropriate places. I agree with everything that she has said, obviously. Um, the research is is a big draw. I think that, um, you know, we are targeting your, your digestive condition. Um, this treatment is very different from general mental health treatment and really helping patients to know that this, these symptoms, this diagnosis is not in your head. Um, that, that's certainly something that um, historically, uh, a patient may hear their gastroenterologist or primary care doctor say, I am going to refer you now to a psychologist. Um, it can be very, the way we discuss that and have that conversation and make that referral makes a big difference in terms of how a patient feels heard, validated, and understood when it comes to really the complexities and difficulties of living with IBS. And so I do a lot of education with my referring providers around how to make the best referral and that I'm just another person in their team. The, the referring provider's not going anywhere. Um, it's not that they don't know what to do with you and send their, so they're sending you off to a GI psychologist. Um, in fact, you know, now people are referred to their GI psychologist kind of first line, second line, instead of it used to be, you know, last thing we can try. Um, I think that the field of GI psychology has done a very good job at, at kind of recognizing that we're not a last ditch effort. Um, we actually have interventions that are very helpful for people that have failed other medical treatments um, that have been refractory to traditional medical interventions. Um, those patients still do very well with the work that we do, as Dr. Peters highlighted. But we don't have to have the people that have failed everything. Um, we can take you uh, at, at, this, at the time that you're diagnosed. Um, and then the last point that I will make is sometimes sitting with patients they really feel like they're the unicorn. Like they, you know, nobody understands my symptoms. You know, I think I've been, they say it's IBS, but I know it's something worse. Um, and so I always use that as the opportunity to help the patient really feel validated that we have a definitive diagnosis, that you have IBS and we have evidence-based strategies that can come from a multidisciplinary perspective. And we can use those interventions and we will help you. We will get you feeling better. We will empower you with tools and strategies. And a lot of times that helps with the skepticism because all of a sudden they have a better understanding of their diagnosis. And, and they also feel like it's not just IBS. It's IBS and here's the plan that we're going to use with you. I think that's a really important point. And I, I wouldn't even just mind, you know, just drawing on that a little bit more because the reality is when these patients spend time with their primary physician or their gastroenterologist, 
they have a very small amount of time with these healthcare professionals. These are really busy individuals. And so often a lot of information is presented to, to these patients and then they go home and they have time to think about that, interpret that in their own way. And often there's this element of confusion around their diagnosis, as Megan has suggested. And I think that this we, we know now that there's really good evidence to suggest that if we give patients a firm diagnosis of irritable bowel, then they are less likely to continue to seek healthcare services. So if you think about a patient who has IBS, they account for over 50% of a gastroenterologist's workload, which is huge, right? And I think that a large component of this overload in terms of it by being seen by the gastroenterologist is often because these patients don't have a firm diagnosis of their condition and therefore this element of worry and concern continue, continues to creep in. So I would agree even before we talk about what psychological therapies we're going to use in these patients the very first thing we would do is provide a really defined diagnosis of irritable bowel, what it means to have irritable bowel, explain the pathophysiology of the condition, talk about the different treatment strategies that are available to them in the realm of all three domains. Um, and then once you've done that, you will often have the patient on board with exploring the psychological based therapies because it then makes sense to them how they've arrived at this point. Um, and obviously there's cue for your, your conversation around what psychological therapies are, of course, the most appropriate. Um, definitely. And I think uh, one thing I just wanted to ask Megan before we move on is you mentioned um, having doing education to your referring providers on um, how how to broach the topic uh, and and how to um, refer IBS patients along. And I was wondering if you could just talk about that briefly. Um, I know we have a lot of providers on, on this call that um, are will be in a position of, of wanting to do that exact thing. Um, a couple of the, the key factors are that we're not here to treat generalized anxiety, depression, um, more severe psychiatric comorbidities. That's not our role as GI psychologists. And so really helping to identify you know, that we're looking for patients that do recognize that stress can impact their symptoms and they're looking for additional tools and strategies to help them manage their condition. Um, that if they do have anxiety or depression, it's related to having their GI condition. So uh, again, there's that visceral anxiety, um, the patient that really recognize, they, they're feeling the intensity of their stomach pains, their urgency, um, and it's driving recurrent visits to um, either the, the doctor or the, the restroom. Um, and we can talk about kind of those GI specific types of anxiety um, or that, you know, I'm changed to the bathroom or I don't want to leave the house very often and that impacts my mood. Um, oftentimes we see that those levels of, of mood and anxiety are more on the you know, moderate range. And, and by using our GI specific strategies, we can address that. But if the anxiety or depression, other mood symptoms is really driven by extenuating psychosocial stressors, um, divorce, uh, finances, um, those types of things that really are best addressed in a longer term therapy setting with a general mental health provider. We really want to make sure that they're establishing care with general mental health first, because if um, those symptoms persist, uh, it's really hard for our interventions to, to do their job. So we, we're looking for more stable mood symptoms if, if a person's having more moderate to severe psychiatric symptoms. Um, Obviously, we're, we're also looking for patients that want to in, in, invest in this type of therapy. Um, I, I think that certainly we do have patients where we're working on buy-in. And so I'll have a colleague that will say, I, I've got them, open. the door is open. They say that they'll come in and see you. Um, I don't know. We'll, we'll go from there. I, I'm usually willing to do a consultation with the person that's interested in learning more. But um, like Dr. Peters said, you know, if, if every 
time the gastroenterologist is seeing the provider, the patient, and they're saying, no, I don't want it. I don't believe in it. I don't want to see a shrink, you know, then let's, let's not spend time, you know, going down that road at that particular point. Um, so I think those are the biggest things to kind of consider is, is, you know, the insightful patient, the motivated patient, the one that um, really connects their symptoms with their um, their stress and, and their mood, and, and we can really work at that, and also in a pretty quick fashion. So anywhere from four to seven sessions, we're typically seeing some improvements. I think um, I can just add also, I think we can also, this is a really good opportunity for healthcare providers to empower the patient, mm -hmm. you know, to let the patient know that there are these different options that are available to them. They can go down the dietary route as an example. We can apply a low FODMAP diet. This is what it's going to look like. These are the expected outcomes that we would achieve. Conversely, this is hypnotherapy. These are the expected outcomes that we can expect to achieve. This is what it looks like. What would you prefer to do? You know, do you have a preference? Does one sit more comfortably with you than the other? Um, and you, there will be examples of patients who will say, I definitely believe that my diet has a role to play. I want to see a dietitian." Or there'll be other examples of patients who say, there's absolutely no way that I want to give up anything that I eat. I love food. Let me see the psychologist. Um, and so sometimes empowering the patient to let them make the decision if we've got a variety of evidence-based strategies that are available to them or with equal degrees of, or rates of efficacy, you know, we, we can let them be included in that decision too. I have a question here from um, one of the, the participants um, around uh, asking if there's a specific way or analogy you use to explain the influence of stress on digestion. Um, I'll, I'll send that one to you, Dr. Peters, but Megan, you're welcome to jump in as well. I think the first thing um, I would do would be to explain what stress is and what stress looks like um, and the difference between, you know, short-term stresses versus sort of more long-term stresses. Um, and then I think I would probably start to try and highlight for the patient the role that stress has on the way that different parts of our nervous system interact with one another. And I probably at this point would start drawing lots of pretty diagrams about the role of the autonomic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system and explain to this patient that they're, if they're in a heightened state of, say, of stress, they're probably more likely to be sitting in that heightened sympathetic state, which is, of course, going to have an impact on the way that their gut works at a physical level. So we would then sort of start to talk a little bit about the role of the, the heightened sympathetic state on one's motility um, and the role of a heightened sympathetic state on what we call visceral hypersensitivity um, so that then they can start to clearly see that even if there are a percentage of their symptoms that are triggered by how they feel psychologically, so they're stressed, but by the time their body is responding physically, it is because of exactly that. There's been a physical change in the way that the body is working. There's been a reduction in blood flow to the gut. There's become a heightened sensitivity in terms of the, the communication between the, the gut and the brain from a nerve perspective. Um, and, of course, this is why it has such a big impact on their digestion um, and equally in at their, their gut symptoms. I think one thing that you can kind of normalize for patients is the idea of butterflies in your stomach, um, that we all have felt that at some point. And usually it happens, you know, um, before a, a, a maybe a, a stressor that's coming up, right, giving a talk, giving a presentation at work. Um, you know, also you can feel some of that if, you know, here in Michigan, um, if you hit black ice and you're you know, driving your car, your sympathetic system ramps up and you feel that maybe in your gut, your heart rate increases, your breathing gets short and shallow during that acute onset of a stressor. But as you pass that stressor, as, as you move through that uncomfortable or scary situation, your body, so that was your sympathetic system, like Dr. Peters was saying, that's that sympathetic fight, flight, or freeze response. As you move through that stressful event, your autonomic nervous system regulates the body again. And we call that kind of the relaxation response that's driven by your parasympathetic system. 
So you have these counter systems that are built into our body. The butterflies start to go away as you start doing the thing that you are looking forward to. The nerves kind of calm down and you move forward. And, and what I'll talk with patients about that have IBS or really any GI condition, because this basically stress can amplify that communication pathway between the brain and the gut. And what happens is the brain has a harder time down regulating those signals that are coming from the gut, which can then amplify those symptoms. So when we get that ramp up of the sympathetic system, fight, flight, or freeze, and it doesn't take, or it takes a while to kind of calm things down, Maybe, you know, you're, you've been to the bathroom once and you're trying to get out the door and then up oh, that urge to go again. Uh, and it just continues to kind of ramp the system up. You're having a harder time getting that down regulation of, of an activation of the relaxation response. Um, so I, I typically describe it, yes, also in pictures, um, and, and I call it kind of the GI stress cycle to, to kind of show how we get stuck in this cycle, but our interventions such as relaxation strategies or cognitive behavioral therapy can really help give you jump in points to help to regulate those systems. And um, diaphragmatic breathing is one of my favorites because it's something that is tangible, it, we can teach it in basically, you know, 15 minutes or less, and you're walking away with a tool that actually activates your parasympathetic system, helping to regulate. So when we can give those examples and, and apply them in, in a first session, uh, and then the patient tries it, it's, it's incredible um, how, how quickly buy-in really starts to happen. That's awesome. Um, I think now we might transition to talk um, more specifically about um, different psychological therapies. So I'll hand it to you, Dr. Peters, um, if you could just give a, a brief explanation of what gut-directed hypnotherapy is. Um, there's been lots of talk about how wonderful it is, but um, we could talk specifically about what it is and how it works. That would be awesome. Okay. So gut-directed hypnotherapy was first described by um, the University of South Manchester um, and the technique is now applied right across the world. So if we think about hypnosis, really all hypnosis is, is deep relaxation. So daydreaming is an example of hypnosis. In saying that, I'm sure people have seen, you know, on the TV and the movies, people clucking like chickens and doing other horrendously embarrassing things. Those people are also in a state of hypnosis. So clearly you can see there's varying levels of depth of hypnosis. So the aim in hypnotherapy is to get people into a really relaxed, comfortable state, which we do that through various relaxation strategies like um, progressive muscular relaxation as an example. And then once the patient is in that really relaxed state, the aim is that we want to provide suggestions to what we call the subconscious part of the mind. So hypnotherapy is the only psychological therapy that targets the subconscious part of the mind as opposed to other psychological interventions which target the conscious part of the mind. So that's a really notable distinction there. So the aim of the gut-directed hypnotherapy is to provide suggestions to that subconscious part of the mind um, and those suggestions are made to enable the control and normalization of gut function. And those suggestions are most frequently done on a repetitive basis. So they're done multiple times in a session over multiple sessions. Um, and we know that that is what equates to the best outcome. Um, so yeah, so interestingly, I just a side note is that um, we've again we've done quite a lot of research because this question often comes up about well, what happens if you can't be hypnotized, right? What happens if you happen to be one of these individuals that just is unhypnotizable? Um, and so we've done quite a bit of research in this space as well, using different hypnotic susceptibility scales. So in other words, looking at how deep one can go into that state of hypnotic trance. 
And what we've been able to identify is that only a very small percentage of people get to a level of depth whereby they have no conscious recollection whatsoever. Um, and when I say a very small percentage, we're looking at about 15%. So only about 15% of, of the, the population will get to that level of depth like what they've seen on the TV and the movies. So it's not that common, right? Um, and so, you know, often this will relieve a lot of patients because they're quite nervous that they're going to act the way that they've seen on the TV and the movies. But then secondary to that, we also know that the depth that they achieve, so the depth of hypnotic state, does not have any correlation with the outcome of the therapy. So deeper doesn't mean better, which is quite interesting um, because one might expect that the deeper you go, the more likely it is that you respond. But actually, in fact, that's not the case. Um, so deep stage of relaxation, target that subconscious part of the mind, provide suggestion, and as long as the patient feels comfortable and relaxed in that state, we know that it is likely to be effective in 80% of people that we use this therapy in. I explain it and you correct me if I'm wrong because I'm sitting here with the, you know, the research expert. But when I have this conversation with my patients, I'll say, you know, really the most important thing that you can be is open. If you're willing to try this intervention, you're sitting here with me, um, which now we recognize is, is equally effective doing it virtually. So they used to be in this office and now it's all virtual. But if you're present with me and you are at least open to trying this, it's very likely we're going to have a positive effect here. 100%. You need the patient buying, absolutely. And I'll often, you know, I'll often give an example, Megan, of this to my patients. You know, if I were your gastroenterologist and I prescribed a medication, it's only going to work if you take it. Similarly, if I'm a dietitian and I recommend a diet, you're only going to see a possible benefit if you apply the dietary change. Similarly, if I'm going to do hypnotherapy with you, you're only, it's only possible for you to fall into that 80% if you actually engage with the therapy. So if you're totally resistant and you don't want really to engage at all, it's probably not the right therapy for you. Not necessarily because it won't work, but because we need an element of buy-in with any therapy in order for it to be effective. Um, but yeah, you're, you're right, Megan. Uh, Dr. Peters, can you explain the difference between hypnotherapy and, for example, mindfulness-based meditation? I know you, you spoke previously about how hypnotherapy is um, applied in patients where um, really you're targeting physical symptoms. And I think there's some confusion over the difference between hypnotherapy and meditation. So there's different types of meditation that obviously can be applied. Um, and so um, it, it, it largely depends on what type of, of mindfulness meditation one is applying. But typically speaking, mindfulness meditation requires a a user or a participant to get into a sort of a calm, relaxed and focused state. So it's that kind of focused state of attention that is required, um, which differs slightly to that in a state of hypnosis, if you like. And then within that focused state, the idea is usually to either desensitise themselves to the external environment or to become more attuned with being able to manage their internal environment. Whereas hypnotherapy is quite different in the context that you might get into that sort of calm, relaxed, even focused state. But within that state, the aim is that we're providing suggestions to that subconscious part of the mind. So it is not uncommon for when we do hypnotherapy, in example, with patients, that they, um, rather when we do, um, actually, no, I was right, when we do hypnotherapy with patients, they're, they're in a meditative state, right? But the thing that makes it hypnosis as opposed to meditation is this introduction of direct suggestion. And it's that direct suggestion to that subconscious part of the mind that makes it hypnotherapy. Um, I have a question here from, from another um, participant. Is, um, 
does hypnotherapy is hypnotherapy only for IBS patients or can it be used in um, other patients with GI conditions, for example, IBD? I can talk a little bit about this. Um, so we have, it, let's go back to the brain and the gut, right? So along our entire digestive tract are a whole bunch of other conditions that can fall uh, in line and um, GERD or reflux, functional heartburn, um, globus, which is a sensation that something feels stuck in the throat, but there's no actual structural abnormality. Um, functional dysphagia, where a patient feels like they have difficulty swallowing. These are some of the GI conditions that can be very difficult to treat, um, but tend to respond very well to our tailored kind of hypnosis intervention. Now, with all of that being said, um, the largest, most robust body of literature is all around irritable bowel syndrome. And we've taken many of those kind of premises of those scripts, the concepts, the, the idea of a protocol, and we've changed those. And, and like Dr. Peter said, the importance is the suggestion and the repetition. So we've shifted those um, uh, suggestions for those different conditions. And um, I think that while there is some supportive research that shows the benefits, um, I think most of us are just doing it in clinical practice because we do know that it's effective. Um, I, I, as just with IBS, you still want to have a medical diagnosis. You want to go through a medical workup. You would never want to be, you know, the first person as a mental health provider that's saying, oh, based on your symptoms, I'm going to do hypnosis. And you've never seen a physician before. Um, and that's where... The, the idea of using hypnosis with inflammatory bowel disease, we can do it. And there's one study that looked at using hypnosis for ulcerative colitis um, that prolonged remission rates for those that were already in remission. Um, however, we still think of it as an adjunctive therapy for inflammatory bowel disease. Um, given the high population of over or high prevalence of overlap in inflammatory bowel disease with about 40% of patients also having IBS, um, I always frame it as this is a benefit. It's a tool for you. It's a strategy. Um, a lot of patients with inflammatory bowel disease that may be in clinical remission or um, objective remission with their, their IBD symptoms that are still having um, symptoms, I, I love to use that intervention. Um, but I think diagnosis is key and then really working with a mental health professional that knows what they're doing and can tailor the scripts um, is, is important for the effectiveness. Um, on the flip side of that, I think it's also, um, it, we'll, we'll turn it over to Dr. Peters to talk about how um, the standardized protocols for gut-directed hypnotherapy can actually be delivered um, digitally without tailoring scripts, specifically for IBS. Um, so I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Peters, to talk about the Nerva app and how, on the flip side of working with a, with a GI psychologist like you, Megan, and tailoring to different GI conditions, how for IBS, um, it, it actually can be delivered via standardized protocol. Um, so I guess when it comes to patients with irritable bowel syndrome, typically speaking, they present with similar symptoms. So we're talking about abdominal pain, which is associated with defecation um, or a change certainly in stool form or frequency. So this is kind of the basis of our suggestion, if you like. It's also very common for patients who present with irritable bowel syndrome to present with abdominal bloating, distension, or have issues around wind. And so in research settings, when we develop protocols, these are delivered um, in the same way with every patient. That's what you need to obviously do in a research setting. There's no individualization of suggestion based on the patient that's presenting in front of you. And so the idea was that if we can deliver these hypnotherapy scripts, if you like, per protocol in a research setting, could we deliver them per protocol in a clinical setting? Could we do that in face-to-face -face settings? Could we do that via telehealth? Could we do that via, you know, app-delivered hypnotherapy? And what we've found over the years is, in fact, that's exactly the case. We can deliver 
these standardized scripts or these standardized protocols to patients, regardless of what strategy we use in terms of deliverance. Um, so if we look at the difference in outcomes from people who are seen in research settings versus those who are seen face-to-face -face versus those who do NERVO, as an example, which is app-delivered gut-directed hypnotherapy, that there is no difference in terms of rates of efficacy or response to therapy. So we can feel reassured that it doesn't need to be tailored to the specific patient in front of you. Now, obviously, this comes down to the idea that we're targeting the right patient population. So if you talk about something like Nerva as an example, the patient population that we're targeting with this app is the irritable bowel population. Now, would a patient who has functional dyspepsia, as an example, respond well to Nerva? Well, I guess the question is they might if some of those suggestions are appropriate, but probably what's more likely is that they're not going to respond as well as if we had developed a protocol that was targeted toward functional dyspepsia, as an example. Um, but if we're targeting the right patient population, standardized, pro standardized protocols work beautifully. There is no need for individualization. You can if you want to be fancy, but you don't need to in terms of rates of response or in terms of rates of efficacy. Um, and, you know, drawing a little more on what Megan was mentioning before, we know that there's a gr really great variety of different functional GI disorders that respond beautifully to behavioural-based therapies, including hypnotherapy. Um, and so there's been some really beautiful studies that have been done by Oliver Palson's group, which have shown that patients who have functional dyspepsia respond beautifully to suggestions that are provided through gut-directed hypnotherapy. Um, and again, these are delivered per protocol. So they're delivered in the same way for each patient um, and we get really, really good outcomes. Can you talk a little bit about, um, and I'll open this up to both of you because you obviously both see patients in person um, and in person or virtually, but on a one-on-one -on -one approach. Um, can you talk a little bit about which patients are, are appropriate for in-person care versus which patients are appropriate for app-based or, or protocol-based care? I think if we look at a silver lining of the pandemic is overwhelmingly we've found that you know patients can certainly benefit from teletherapy. Um, I think that when it comes to working with me or working with the Nerva app, um, at least, you know, as, as an, uh, a provider out in the field doing this work, um, I think that patients that have limited access to actually coming to see me or Dr. Peters or, you know, our probably 400 colleagues around the world, um, those patients should seek out the app-based op option. It's better than you know, or it's comparable to in-person treatment. Certainly, um, Dr. Peters' research has shown that. Um, so I think that the majority of patients that we're seeing in person could probably benefit from the app. Yeah, I agree. There's, there's very few patients in whom um, you would think would be more appropriate to receive you know, one-on-one -on -one in-person care versus app-delivered care. Um, and again, usually those patients are the ones who are more um, complex from a medical perspective or complex from a psychological perspective. But if you've got somebody who's sitting in front of you who is sort of a textbook irritable bowler, it's probably more effective, much easier for them, less expensive for them to um, engage with therapy via an app-delivered model as opposed to one-on-one -on -one care. Um, and we can feel confident in saying that because we know the rates of efficacy are the same. It would be different if the rates of efficacy weren't the same, in which case we would be encouraging patients that if they had the option for face-to-face -face care then to, to engage with that. But the reality is, like Megan mentioned, there just isn't an, enough GI-focused psychologists around the world. And even if you happy, happen to be a very lucky patient and you are within the catchment area for one of these specific um, practitioners, um, 
you then have to get in to see that particular person. So the first step is actually identifying that somebody is in your local area. The second step is actually being able to get an appointment with that person. And I know certainly here in Australia, the wait lists are, you know, are months, even longer than a year if you're going through the public health care system. Um, and then obviously there's typically costs associated with that. So, you know, going to see somebody for one-on-one -on -one care um, is typically more costly than what it would be to do um, the hypnotherapy as an example via, via the app. Um, and this was one of the reasons why um, I was so interested in, in developing Nerva was because we have this really great opportunity to be able to help patients who we just don't have the capacity to see in clinic. Um, and we can do so in a way that is very safe for them to be able to utilise we can do so in a way that is cost effective and achieves the same outcomes. Um, and so, you know, I think with the with with the pandemic and and the um, I suppose the the change in in all of our behaviour in the context of uh, being more open minded to to telehealth or to to digital um, therapeutics or digital options, I suppose we're all much more open minded to it now. It, you know, in 2023 than perhaps what we were in 2019. Um, Megan, can you talk a little bit about um, which patients should be excluded from, from hypnotherapy and if there's any patients that just are, are really are not a good fit for, for care with hypnotherapy? It goes back to, you know, untreated psychiatric concerns. So if somebody has um, uh, untreated trauma history, um, active post-traumatic stress symptoms, those are patients we're going to prioritize for more comprehensive mental health treatment. Um, again, these interventions are very focused on the digestive condition. And so um, your digestive condition is unlikely to get better if your mental health is suffering. And, and we want to prioritize that because if we do, it's very likely that the digestive condition is going to get better. Um, so those are the patients that, you know, sometimes, um, and I've had this happen, a, a patient came in, in person with me and said, you know, you're saying I'm not a, able to, to do hypnosis. Can I do the the Nerva app? And, and in fact, I reached out to Dr. Peters and we talked about this, that, you know, Sure, the patient could do the Nerva app, um, but it's again, it's not going to help with some of the psychiatric um, concerns that the patient was having, and therefore, um, you know, I was able to to direct them and, and help them gain some some additional information. I think another patient population where we have to be a little bit careful. Um, is those patients who might already be in an altered state of consciousness. So schizophrenic, yeah. a schizophrenic patient, as an example. Um, so we just need to be mindful that, you know, we're, the patient that we're providing the therapy to is of within a, a mental state to be able to receive the suggestion that we deliver. Um, and, if, and if those boxes are ticked, um, then it's an exceptionally safe therapy with virtually no side effects. Um, but we do need to make sure that, you know, that they're in a good place psychologically and they're not in an altered state of consciousness already. Um, you both work, uh, obviously, in, in, multidisciplinary, um, in a multidisciplinary setting. Um, can you speak a little bit about um, how psychological therapies for IBS patients fit into a sort of a broader uh, treatment modality and how providers can incorporate it as one aspect um, and specifically whether or not it has to be sort of standalone as, as um, or can be combined with other treatment modalities at the same time. I think the most empowering thing for the patient is exactly that, is to have a multidisciplinary team supporting them. And I think that we as healthcare providers get the best outcome when similarly we're working within a multidisciplinary domain. Um, so most patients whom I manage will have a primary physician and or a gastroenterologist. Most will have engaged with some sort of dietary-based therapy most will have potentially seen psychological or psychiatric care in the past. 
Some will have done um, pelvic floor physiotherapy, as an example. Um, and so there might be quite a large number of different people that are all working together for the best outcome for this patient. And I think this works beautifully when every member of the multidisciplinary team communicates with one another. And if everybody communicates with one another and everybody's on exactly the same page in terms of what we're achieving for this patient or what we're hoping to achieve for this patient, then I think the patient does very, very well from that. Ultimately, we want our patients to be well with as minimal pharmaceutical intervention as necessary, with as minimal dietary intervention as necessary, with as minimal psychological intervention as necessary. Um, and so, again, you know, if we're all on the same page with, with how we're, we're going to achieve that, um, then the patient, um, that's usually the best outcome for the patient. Um, but in saying all of that, we do know that people respond very well to a, a single modality. Um, so, you know, we know that people respond beautifully to a low FODMAP diet in isolation. We know that people respond beautifully to hypnotherapy or cognitive behavioural therapy in isolation. We know that people respond beautifully to a laxative-based therapy or an antidiarrheal in isolation where appropriate. Um, but, you know, there doesn't often come a time when um, that person will respond better to a combination of different therapies. And I'll give an example. You know, the patient might go and see a gastroenterologist. The gastroenterologist puts the patient on a fiber supplement and an antidiarrheal. They send them off to my clinic. They come and see one of my dietitians. One of my dietitians beautifully applies a low FODMAP diet. The patient responds very well to the combination of the, the medication and, and the diet. And then when they come back six weeks later and we're trying to convince them to reintroduce some of those FODMAPs back into their diet, they are totally opposed to the idea because this is the first time that they've felt well in years. Now, at that point, my dietitian might say, well, yeah, you're right. We have got your symptoms beautifully controlled with the use of the diet and the medications that have been prescribed to you. But how about we also now consider the utilisation of hypnotherapy or cognitive behavioural therapy so we can start to address those symptoms from a psychological perspective so that actually we can get you to start to liberalise your diet so we can target the same mechanism, we can target your motility, we can target the visceral hypersensitivity with the hypnotherapy as an example, and then hopefully we can liberalise your diet, we can get some of those FODMAP-containing foods back in, which will, from a um, bacterial um, diversity perspective um, is really good. We want people's microbiome to be as absolutely as diverse as, as possible, and obviously the best way of doing that is by them eating fermentable carbohydrates, which is, of course, the, these FODMAPs. And so if we can utilise the hypnotherapy to encourage them to liberalise their diets, um, then that's the best outcome, right? Um, and then it may or may not be that if we can change the diets in a particular way that they don't need that fibre supplement that the gastroenterologist recommended initially. Or if we can alter their motility through the combination of the hypnotherapy and the diet, that they don't need that antidiarrheal in the long term. Um, and so, you know, again, trying to utilise, you know, these examples for the best outcome of the patient. We take a very similar approach. <laughs> we have, um, you know, all of those experts, and I, I think the the benefit is that it's not my job as the the GI psychologist to determine what nutritional um, therapy may be best for the patient. Um, it's not my job to determine what the the medication management route may be with the gastroenterologist, but we are all aware of each other's roles, treatments, interventions. I can help support. So I can help with some of that food-based anxiety or fear. I can help provide psychoeducation around why your gastroenterologist provided an antidepressant um, and, and kind of why that it's, again, it's not in your head. It's, it's something that's happening between the, the brain and the gut. Um, so I think the team approach certainly provides the patient with additional support during, you know, a period where we are, you know, we're, we're getting ready to launch them into a healthier lifestyle. 
and and it does take some work and effort to get there. Um, but if we can, especially as the psychologists who tend to have a little more time with these patients, um, that that can make a huge difference in terms of their success rate. Uh, this is awesome. I realize that we're we're over time now, so I'll cut it off there. But um, this is really excellent, and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Real, Dr. Peters. Um, I think this is an, an invaluable hour for for nerva referring providers, and um, we really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. All right. Have a great night and morning. <laughs> okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.